I always say to clients that podcasting is a bad way to build an audience, but it's a great way to build a relationship with an existing audience. And so what I found then was that these, the relationships I built with the audience were incredible. I'm your host, Brent Weaver. And today we are hanging out with Tom Hunt. Tom is the founder of Fame.so. Yeah. He starts and grows B2B businesses. Before that, he studied chemistry at Imperial College in London. And his current agency, Fame, went from zero clients to 33 clients and about a 70,000 a month run rate, 25 people on the team in less than two and a half years, fully remote. And we're going to be talking about that agency. We're going to be talking about success with B2B podcasting and so much more in this episode. Tom, welcome to the program. Brent, thank you for having me. Obviously, we're on a podcast, but why why podcasting mm. for you? What was your thing that got you into this space? Yeah, it's a great story. Basically, 2015, I just studied chemistry, spent four years working at management consulting companies, like really bored. So I, like, I got to leave. Then like long story short, I end up building like an Upwork but just for Filipino virtual assistants called Virtual Valley. Amazing journey. And there were six months where we were building the platform with some freelancers in Egypt, actually. And my job then, I was traveling the world, but I just spent all my time building awareness for the platform that was going to launch in six months. And the best thing I did, actually the best thing, better than the whole business, was I started a daily show that was called Zero to Four Million, a startup's bootstrap journey to a seven-figure exit. And so I did seven months of a daily like five to 10 minute show of just the process of building, launching, and then growing that online marketplace back in 2016, 17. And that, I mean, ultimately the business was sold not for very much, got revenue, but then I was like a little bit overwhelmed, me self-funding that with no technical co-founder. So I sold the business. But the show was probably one of the biggest things, the best things that happened. <laughs> I think we got sponsorship from like AHREFs, and the audience, there's just like an amazing audience. Uh, like people wanting to invest from the audience. I have like mm. connections now from the audience. And so that was like my start into the podcasting world. And I haven't checked out that show, but yeah. Yeah. the title of the show was Zero to Four Million. So the concept I'm assuming was your journey, like behind the scenes to exactly. achieve this behind the scenes. Yeah. No and interviews. What's interesting, so no interviews, you just kind of talked about that experience. And I feel like I've seen, like, I always feel like that's like the risk of creating a show where it's like, so goal or like, hey, this is the behind the scenes of me achieving this thing is like the likelihood of achieving a goal like that is like, it's really, really hard, right? Let alone, I mean, that's yeah. probably why it makes such great content. Exactly. So you gave people kind of a behind the scenes of that journey through a daily, basically a daily audio vlog for seven months. And, but, and the strategy, so I would actually do it on a Sunday night. Mm -hmm. I'd sit down, write out my learnings from the previous week, and then bang it out, send it to the editor, and then that would be it. So it actually didn't take that much time. Promotion was just through like the audience and the blog that I was building. And then I probably guessed it on some other shows as well. But yeah, it was amazing. I wish, I mean, if I just kept, if I kept the business and kept the podcast, it would have been great, but I didn't keep either, so... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, at some point you decided, but... okay, this business isn't going to work. And obviously that means the podcast like has to come to a close if we're not going to keep pursuing this, this individual vision. But that kind of got you into podcasting, got you, I assume, doing a show every week. I mean, I just know from personal experience, you kind of sharpen your skills and you learn a lot every about day. the podcasting platform. You kind of figure that stuff out. Yeah, it was more like the connections that are built with the audience. I always say to clients that podcasting is a bad way to build an audience, but it's a great way to build a relationship with an existing audience. And so what I found then was that these, the relationships I built with the audience were incredible. Probably because I was taking them on this journey that ultimately failed, but yeah, that was the magic. And I wish I could... I need to put that quote... Like, because we do a lot of mm. coaching and training in our community. And I feel like there's... Uh, people see that we have a podcast... 
they see that we get a lot of leads and they just connect the two dots. Like, oh, Brent has a podcast and, and he gets lots of leads, right? Like, so I'm going to do a podcast. And I'm always like, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> it's a terrible way to get leads. Like, if you have a list, if you have an audience, it's a great way to stay in people's ears. And the amount of our existing customers and potential customers who come up to us and say, hey, I've been listening to your podcast for a long time. It's the podcast usually isn't how people find us. They usually find us through like, our website or lead magnets or Facebook ads or partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. And then they discover we have a podcast and then that's kind of how we stay in front of them. But I think a lot of people mistake a podcast. They think, oh, I'm going to launch a podcast and I'm going to get leads. I'm going to, yeah. I'm just going to find like, I'll list it on iTunes and yeah. all will be taken care of. <laughs> yeah, they go to top 10 on iTunes on the launch and they're just going to stay there forever. And it's just going to be free attention for the rest of their business career. That's, that's I mean, the vision. Yeah. So what were some of the things that you did to build the audience? You obviously got a lot of... You did end up getting a large audience from this show. It sounds like you got some spark, some sponsorship potentials and things like that. I mean, was there anything that you did besides focusing on the content to grow the audience and the reach of the show? Yeah, so at the same time, I did... I think it was like 30... It was like 42 guest blog posts in like three months. And so... Because I had nothing else to do, right? I was like product managing the build of this marketplace. But then I was just working all hours of the day. And so it was just this like content, like social play that I ran for six months. Banged out of the guest blog post, started blogging on our own blog. I just went hard at that. I was guest on other shows. So we're obviously always linking back to our blog, which would get people to the podcast. But aside from that, no. And there was no guests, right? So I wasn't leveraging their audience. So it was just... I think what I did right was it was slightly unusual to have a daily story podcast with such a like egregious title. So I think I did that right. <laughs> but aside from that, there was no magic to like building the, the audience. Yeah. Did anybody email you at the end of like, they were like, you like, like you know, you told us you were going to get to 4 million and you didn't do yeah. it, right? <laughs> no, I didn't get any of emails, but it would have been depressing if I did. Yeah. I guess people just felt like, felt bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of truth to just that entrepreneurial journey where we sit down and we like write on a notepad, like I'm going to build a $10 million business, right? Like that's the easy part. It takes guts, I think, to put an audacious, audacious vision and an audacious goal out there. But I think the reality behind a zero to $4 million journey is that there's, you know, there's a lot of odds stacked against you, even if you're yeah. the greatest of entrepreneurs. I know people that are super smart, have had super successful businesses, but they've got like five or six failures in the can, you know, and then they have the one idea that they're like, yeah, I didn't even think this was going to work. I kind of just, you know, mm. threw some energy behind it and whoop, this one took off, right? And you're like, oh, wow, dude, you're an overnight success, 35 years in the making, right? That's actually a nice segue, though, to the start of fame. I don't know if you want to get onto that yet, yeah. but, but we can if you want, because that's essentially what happened. Yeah. So you took this yeah. thing that worked and mm. then how long was it between when you stopped the podcast and realized that there was something here? Yes, yeah, so I saw the podcast 2017, I think. Fame only started 20, well, the start of 2020. So three years. Still did a lot of other stuff in those years. <laughs> you don't need to go into all the stuff I did. <laughs> but the next relevant step was for the year of 2019, I was head of marketing at a B2B software company. and. When I joined, I was like, there's this new persona. We sold sales software. And I was like, there's this new persona, this new role which is emerging within businesses that would be our customers that I think is a perfect person to sell to. This person is sales operations. So we had all these different personas. And I was like, this is the one. I went to the CEO. I was like, this is the one. And so then obviously as a marketer, you have to sell to someone you need to learn about them. So from my LinkedIn profile, I like messaged loads of them being like, can I jump on a call with you so I can ask you questions? Right? Not a great pitch. <laughs> Didn't get any responses. But then I was like, well, why don't we start a podcast called Sales Ops Demystified and just start inviting these people to be interviewed on the show? So that's what we did. Soon after that, we had our like ideal customers, from my eyes, coming into our office to be interviewed when previously they would just ignore me. So that was great. We started releasing some of the episodes, very like low production quality, but we got some like the guests were sharing a bit of social engagement, a bit of SEO, because every episode was a blog with a blog post on our site. The CEO was happy because there was, we were doing outreach through his LinkedIn profile, so he was happy with like the engagement. But then something magical happened, and the VP of Sales Ops at a company I probably shouldn't name, but like a B two B SaaS company that most people know, came on the show and then randomly got chatting with the CEO afterwards, and then in six, it was four months later. 
bought our sales software for all 180 of their sales teams. And so that was like a deal that immediately gave us a 9 to 10x return on the time and money we spent on the show. And I was like, if the holy grail of B2B marketing, because you can attribute direct ROI, but then have long-term brand building benefits. And so I was like to my employer, I'm going to leave, do this. Would you like to be our first client? They said, yes. And then all we've done is take that process we were developing for that show while we were employed and then just copied and pasted it, essentially. That's fame. So having, I always kind of look at this as the, you know, using content as a Trojan horse to get qualified prospects right on the phone with you. And I think that's a strategy that I think in whether it's video blogging or podcasting has been around for a while. How long do you think it, do you think that that strategy is it yet of risk being ruined by marketers yet in terms of? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that the first like year of fame. And but then more recently, I think you can't directly pitch people to come on the show. What you can do is give the guest an amazing experience. Just keep like being exposed to the guests over the because especially in the high level like B2B sales, no one's just like ready to buy. It's like in six months they they have a need, right? And then they're just gonna scan through the brains of the people who they know or like in the area and they'll reach out. So for anyone doing this, we don't recommend like pitching people that come on your podcast. It just gives them an amazing experience, make them look amazing, and then just build the relationship over time. Yeah. And, and that is not going away. That's just like good business practice, good business yeah. networking. Because I've definitely, so I've um, definitely been invited to shows where on both ends, after the episode, I'm then sold or, you know, attended yeah. to sell, right? Where it's like, okay, cool. The episode's over. Now, by the way, who does your blank? And you're like, oh my yeah. God. Oh no, here it is, right? And then you like, you do the due diligence. You're like, oh wow, your episodes have like nine views. I get what this is all yeah. about. I've also been invited on shows where they, the podcast is like, is an unapologetic funnel. It's like straight up, you get booked on the show and then they have a VA show up like for the first 10 minutes of the interview or something. And the VA is like, okay, hey, thanks for scheduling this time with me. We'll get the host on here in a few minutes, but I just want to run you through the packages for us promoting you. And I'm like, what? Yeah, like, this is, yeah, this is yeah, crazy. Yeah. Like the, where the guest is like, literally the product is we're going to promote your episode and you're going to pay us for mm-hmm. it. And so I feel like yeah. there are people doing some things that I'm not a huge fan of, but I'm a huge fan of what you just walked through, which is using this as a way to make people look great, whether they buy from you or not, and then use it as like a foundational relationship building tool. And then also then you get the long-term benefit of having a podcast where you're educating your target market around things they care about, which I think those are all things that have huge upside but are also harder and less instant gratification. And so I always feel like that creates a natural moat around, you know, it's hard for marketers to ruin that because it's like, let's systematize a six-month relationship mm. build process. That feels a little bit less less hackable. Yeah, exactly. So talk us through, let's say you're an agency owner out there right now and you're thinking about using podcasting as a strategy. I mean, earlier you said it's a really bad way to build an audience. You know, who should be thinking about this strategy and how it could apply to their business. Do they really, should they have an existing audience? Should they already be really well niched? Should they know exactly who their target customer is? Who are the types of people that building a podcast to build long-term B2B relationships would work for? I think the other door, the, the three points you mentioned, it's just like, yes. Ideally, your agency should be, uh, it's kind of like business practice, but ideally specifically niched. If your agency is, and then we probably recommend that your show would be within a niche that, if sub niche within your agency niche, there are better ways to build an audience first. I would probably recommend ideally trying to build an email list first, or at least like start creating written content first to start the SEO process. And so, if you have all of those things, then yeah, I would recommend a show. But I would try to ensure there's something remarkable or different about mm. the show. Like thinking back to my example of the zero to. The four million startups be so journey to something exit. Pretty remarkable. Now, if we go back to the sales ops one, the thing we did there is we got the timing right. Like this sales ops role was just like emerging, it was just getting popular. And we just absolutely hammered it. We used to do two a week. We've done 200 now. And we had a big focus on this per like their, them and their career, like how they got into sales ops, where they think sales ops is going. And so we were just so focused on that persona. So I think that's how, why that. So we got the timing right and we were just really focused on that person and their career. So that's just two examples of how we made shows different. Another one that I like that is doing something a little bit different is called Metrics and Chill. 
the I don't know who the company is, which maybe is a bad sign, but they have like metrics, data analytics software. And then all they do every episode is just they, they have a guest on, they talk about one metric. And the questions are pretty much the same every episode. Like, what is the metric? How do you track it? Why is it important? And so every episode is just one single metric. And so that's what I like. That's like quite remarkable. That's also good for SEO because then every episode could just rank for like, what is X metric? Do you know what I mean? So that's just like three examples of how people have done stuff like slightly different. So being able just to say, you know, to launch a show just purely around like a been there, done that avatar is going to be harder now, right? To build an audience around that. You've got to really think a little bit harder about about what you're trying to accomplish in the market for it to work. I'm surprised, I guess I'm not surprised, but I'm always, the amount of podcasts that, you know, quote unquote launch, but then fizzle out. And do you have any intuition of of why that is? Of why people launch something and they just don't realize how much is involved in actually carrying on a show, whether it's a weekly or twice a week or daily. That starts giving me like heart palpitations of having to produce an episode every day. But why Why are some shows that get out there, why do they not work for people? Why do they quit? Yeah, I think you have like an emotional journey, right? Like pre-podcast, you're like here. And then you're like, as you start thinking about the podcast, you start going up and then you think about name and you're really happy. And then you probably peak like a couple of days after launch where you've like done your LinkedIn post, got a few <laughs> likes, people are like, oh my God, I love the show. And so, so you're going to peak there at just two days after launch. And then from there, it's probably like a slow <laughs> decrease, right? And maybe there'll be little spikes if you get a good guest or you get good feedback. But then for any show, there's going to be, if you do launch promotion, you're going to go down like this. And then they'll get a point where your emotion towards a podcast is not worth the effort or the emotional reward is not worth mm-hmm. the effort you're putting in. I think that's the same with like any new thing that you need to do. Maybe it's a little bit more intense for podcasting because there's a bit a few more like moving parts. And so the secret there is like systemize and give if you're the host or you're the CEO, the person responsible for the podcast, is to systemize and get everyone else, get other people that you're paying to do the work. And so if you're the host, ideally you just find out who the guest is a few minutes before, turn up, do your thing, perform. And then you don't have to do anything else. Right? That's the secret for getting a podcast to last. But we can talk about your podcasting system if you want, Brent. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to say, I think you're describing the digital agency show at our 250 plus yeah, episodes. Yeah, okay, let's and do I, it. Let's I break think it down. That, that got, there was definitely a point in time where the overhead or lack of system had a strong tie on the motivation. And there's... I mean, if you look back at our release schedule, if somebody went through the fine tooth comb, you can definitely see kind of some blips and blurbs. I think we've kind of gotten, it's taken us like four or five years to get super consistent. And there's still some misses. I mean, you even look at like a 52 weeks in the year, even if we have a less than 5% error rate on shows releasing on time, or even a 2% error rate, that still means we're probably missing about one show per year. And that's a really like, if you do anything and you have a 98% success rate on something, but I think if you look back at some of the early years, there were definitely some inconsistencies in publishing, which was a direct result of what you're talking about, the emotional energy being super high, not having a pipeline of guests built out, not having a system for booking guests, not having a system for evaluating guests. We used to just take guest requests like over email. And it was like this just complete mess of, you know, I'd have to ask them like basic questions. Like somebody would be like, hey, I want to be on your show. And then I'd be like, okay, tell me about who you are. And I mean, some people come up with like really organized pitches. And we probably have, I'd say like 10 to 20% of our guests are done through pitches. Although we probably have 20 pitches, maybe 30 pitches for every spot that we accept Mm. a pitched guest for. So we do a lot of filtering on that. But that's even just like a basic thing. We didn't have a form, you know, for years. And then we put a form Mm. where people have to put in the same information. We've got a team that goes through and kind of screens people out that are not a fit for our audience. And then having a process where that team then presents kind of a list where I can just go through and check people and say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then they go off and do the booking. Even just having guest schedule, having a page that kind of talks about guest prep for how the show works, having all the automations built where people schedule the show and it like sends a Calendly's and it gets Dropbox folders created for the mm. assets and gets, you know, I mean, all yeah. that kind of stuff. It's taken us a while to get that stuff dialed in. And now it's pretty much show up, do the host thing, 
I like literally drag the episode into a Google Drive folder. There's a zap that's just like waiting for it. And then it just sends it to the right people. And then it's kind of taken care of from there. That being said, Tom, I think that one of the things that... I think it's been nice to have those things created and those systems built so that we can focus on guest selection, get great guests on the program, make sure we've got the right material to interview well, but then also focus on actual like audience building. So getting people to make sure they promote the episode, making sure that our guests send out emails or social media, making sure they have assets. So those are some of the, I think, more interesting things in terms of business growth that you get to work on once you have those core systems in place. I think there was a period in time where every episode I did, I had another one to two hours of work to do to like get the episode to the right people and tell them what we talked about and all that kind of stuff. And you don't think about it. You're like, oh, it's just a couple hours, right? But again, that's a couple hours every single week. And if you fall behind on that thing, you know, after three weeks, all of a sudden you're like, man, that's a day of work. That's like, you got the actual episode of your recording and then you've got another five or six hours of getting caught up on all of your, your, like your backlog. And so I think what we've done really well is just get rid of that necessary backlog, right? Just drop the audio into a folder. So I'm sure you guys even have some better systems that you use because you guys do this for a living. But I think having, reducing that friction, I think has helped us get to 250 plus. Yeah. Well, you fed in essentially where people need to get to in order to minimize the emotions of the host. The host is normally the person who's driving the show or probably paying for the show. <laughs> and so we have to protect the host's host yeah. time and attention. Well, and that's interesting that you put it more into like an emotional bucket versus like mm. a time thing or like, because I, I do feel like when you have that motivation, it's like time doesn't even matter, right? When you're thinking about launching the podcast, like you don't care, you just blew like a week and a half listening mm. to like 10 other competitive podcasts and mapping out the next eight months of your content, right? Like all of a sudden, like that time doesn't matter. But six months into it, man, that extra two hours a week that you got to do to keep moving the project forward, like it's like all of a sudden that two hours feels like it weighs like a million and a half pounds. So once somebody has a show, what are some of the things that they can do in that relationship build component, whether it's with the guests on the show or with their audience that you've seen actually creates those results? I mean, obviously you had that really cool case study where big target market customer comes on the show and six months later, they buy 100 seats of the platform. That's obviously a big win. But I mean, what are some of those tactical level things that you find that work well to keep that relationship alive where you don't feel like you're just like checking in with somebody like, oh, hey, by the way, it was great having you on the show. You want to do another virtual coffee, right? I mean, I feel like sometimes I get that vibe from people that host podcasts where it's like, they didn't ask me to buy right after our first call, but like I still get the impression that the objective was lead building or business building kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. Like what are some things that you can do to make it to where it's not, it doesn't seem like that so outwardly? Yeah, I think it can be non-sleazy to send stuff, a physical thing, typically, okay. that ideally isn't branded with your own brand. Ideally, something personalized, just so there's a physical reminder of you in their media space. And I think that's non sleazy. We recommend that to clients. And then after that, it's more just around, because assuming now this person is connected to you on LinkedIn. So if you or like other people in your team are connected to them as well, I just recommend that these, that clients or hosts, podcast hosts, and their team are just like saying intelligent stuff in the area on LinkedIn just to stay at top of mind around these people. That just increases the chances that you're going to get that inbound when they do need something that you sell. Mm. I think a combination of those two things is going to increase the likelihood they're going to remember you when they come to the point that they actually need the thing that you have. In, in like, and, and both of those in my eyes are like non fee non salesy and will seem like seamless in the potential client's mind when they're thinking about who they want to buy this thing from. That's really interesting. I have um, on the physical side, our listeners can see this, but I have a, a YouGuru's coaster from a guest that we had. James Rose was on, on our show, or maybe I was on his show. I can't remember the sequence of events that got me the coaster, but I have a coaster, and this thing is, has been on my desk now for... And, and so they... So that person put your logo on the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the secret. Because if they put their, send you something with their logo on, it's just a bit like shit. And it's something that's going to be there. This is very clever with this person. Because it's going to be something that's going to be there when you're working, when you're thinking about that thing you need to buy. 
So that's the most perfect example. It's funny too, because the coaster itself, and I don't, I mean, I'm sure James is not listening to this episode, but if he is, dude, thanks for the coaster again. And James is an awesome dude from Content Snare, but it's actually like a really thick wooden coaster. Mm. And this thing has literally ruined like two keyboards. But it has my logo on it because I'll have coffee on it, right? And the coffee like falls off the edge and it's thick enough that it actually will spill the coffee like onto the keyboard. And it has my logo on it. And I still, I know it's like causing damage to Mm. my, you know, every year I, every year I like lose a keyboard, but I keep the coaster. So I feel like the the stickiness of those gifts can be really high. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. It's almost like we planned that. (laughs) So Tom, this has been uh, dude, this has been awesome. I love having people come on the show to talk about podcasting. Obviously, while we're on a podcast, not that that's like super meta, but I think that it helps our listeners sometimes realize what goes on behind the scenes of putting together a product like this for people, and also hopefully help them if they decide to do it for themselves. Maybe give them some ideas of how to do it better or stick with it longer to get real business results, or maybe even help deter people who think like, oh yeah, I'm going to do a podcast, but then they start listening and they're like, wait a minute, I don't want to deal with any of that stuff, right? And maybe save them that heartache and emotional journey of that roller coaster that you guys, you know so well. Yeah, I mean, that would be the ultimate win for this episode if we stopped 10 people from doing a podcast (laughs) that they were going to invest in and then stop after three months. Well, and maybe they'll... I mean, it sounds like it worked out for you. You you went longer than three months, right? Seven months of Mm. daily. I mean, that's over 150 episodes. Obviously, that was... If you can go that long. Maybe if you're... You know you're not going to be committed for a long time. Just commit for a lot of Mm. frequency. and Yeah, uh, just commit your whole life to the show. Like, give up your business (laughs) and your family for seven months. I have talked to people who are like, yeah, I'm just going to launch a podcast and that's my business model. And I'm just like, oh man, that sounds so hard. Right. We're like solid break even on sponsor revenue covering like hard costs of production. So that, really. that, that's a great place to be. I feel like is that a symbiosis between it covers production costs, but it doesn't put us in a net negative on the show, which is a good place to be at after five years. Mm. Dude, do you have a few minutes to stick around for lightning round? Yeah. What is the best advice you've ever received? Uh, it was a university professor. I was doing chemistry a chemistry project. We don't need to go into details. But we did a test and the test came out negative. So I hadn't built the thing that I thought I was trying to build. And he said, Tom, a negative result is just as valuable as a positive result. I really understand it at the time. But what he's saying is that even if you fail, you can learn, really. I love that. Which of your personal habits has contributed most to your success? Question. I think it would probably be reading. You read every day? Not every day, but I I go quite hard at reading. I actually go through phases. But yeah, I've read, yeah, I just ever since like I started getting to business and like entrepreneurship and self help, I've just read. And anything good that I've done, I can normally track back to a book. Can you share an internet resource tool or app that you use regularly that you think our listeners would find valuable? Yeah, the little one that I've got on my desktop right here, Monosnap. Just a screenshotting tool. You can take screenshots very fast with a shortcut on Mac, then add colored arrows. When you're working with a remote team, it's sometimes a picture can be worth a thousand words, so that can save people a lot of time, I think. Speaking of reading as a habit, what book would you recommend and why? Mm. I think the most impactful book I've read, I'm not sure how relevant it is to agency owners, but you never know, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. Uh, that, that's just like changed fundamentally my understanding of the world. So yeah, that's that would be the one. Awesome. Well, we will link out to the selfish gene as well as mono snap. I feel like I'm going to leave this episode and go download that because I've been. Yeah, I love Skitch, but without being an Evernote subscriber, hey, I, switched, I switched from Skitch because it was crashing Slack. When I put too many arrows on a screenshot, it would crash Slack. So this led me to mono snap. So the UI is not that. It's pretty similar to Skitch, but it's a bit faster and doesn't crash Slack. So. Well, that's good. That's good. I have, yeah. I have realized there's been some weird things like that. So I'm mm-hmm. personally going to go download Monosnap and maybe, maybe you just created a conversion for them today. Tom, how can folks find out more about you? Is there anything that you have they can check out? I think just fame.so is fame and then Twitter and LinkedIn is Tom Hunt. You should be able to find me. Awesome. Well, we will link out to fame.so. 
O, S as in yeah. Sam, so S-O. Yeah. Tom, thanks again for stopping by the program today. It was a pleasure, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs>